Good afternoon, my name is Colton Lehu, um, and today we'll be discussing inverse kinematics with respect to a scalar manipulator. So just to preface, I'd like to you know, note some trig identities that I've used um, and will use throughout the demonstration. I'll say it's not necessary that you memorize these, but it's good to know the kind of general form so that as you're working through problems um, in the future, um, it makes your math a lot simpler and you will see some of these relationships show up as you add more and more frames um, to your manipulators. Uh, one thing I would also like to note is notation. So here in the bottom right corner, so uh, later on I will use kind of the notation such that C1 is equal to cosine of theta 1 um, and C12 is equal to cosine theta 1 plus theta 2. Um, this will translate um, similarly for sine as well. Um, this is one thing to note too because it can be confusing with the C that is denoted for law of cosines. So with inverse kinematics, um, as the name entails, uh, it's the opposite of forward kinematics. So we are obtaining the joint variables, and this is you know, your thetas, for your revolute joints, and your D for your prismatic joints. And you know we do so by knowing the final position of the end effector. Um, and in, or in order to do that, we need the variables, so these two. Um, as functions of the end effector coordinates. So this is going to be your zero, or O sub X, O sub Y, and O sub Z. So today we'll be worried about the scalar manipulator. I have two figures here. Uh, so figure 510 is probably what we're worried about. It gives us a nice perspective um, for drawing our triangles as we will be doing inverse kinematics uh, in a geometric sense. But figure 311 is actually from a previous chapter. But um, I like that it shows the end effector here in a different frame. So it shows the attachment to the revolute joint. And one thing to note here is that the revolute joint here does not affect the overall position of the end effector, but it does affect the orientation. Um, and so I wanted to show that because it shows the additional joints. Um, this one just shows the three. So moving on, uh, so we need to understand what our desired variables are. So part of inverse kinematics, we are solving for those joint variables um, with respect to the end effector position. So the figure here on the right um, actually does have these labeled, uh, but I will translate these over to figure 510. So our desired variables here are going to be theta 1, theta 2, d3, and theta 4. So looking at figure 510, uh, we will start by assigning frames. So here, Ooh. here we have frame 0, frame 1, frame 2. And then one thing to note here, so this uh, CC, this is the center of our end effector. So this will be actually to keep up with the, con the notation of theta 4 um, and the notation from figure 311 we will have that and denote that as frame four. So one good thing to note is that here there is frame three, and that actually correlates with the revolute joint over here in figure 311. So now that we have our frames, uh, I can designate our desired variables as well as our link lengths. So here we can designate a one, a two, and now we worry about our joint variables. So one thing to note, so we have theta 1 that's actually already assigned to us. Um, and that describes the rotation of frame 0 that affects frame 1. So then we need, for theta 2, we need the angle that affects uh, frame 2 that is a rotation about frame 1. So we'll extend out on to that link, the A1 link, and get our theta 2. And now we need the D3, which is a translation of frame 2 that affects the position of frame 3, which means it will be located here. And lastly, we have theta 4, which is just a rotation of that revolute joint at frame 3 that affects the orientation of the end effector. So we can just do that as a rotation of theta 4. And now that we have labeled all of our desired variables and length lengths, we can begin finding our joint variables. We will begin by finding theta 2. 
So when we're typically finding angles of triangles, we do so using certain properties such as sine, cosine, tangent, but here, or log cosines, um, but here with those, uh, they require side lengths. So this would be your opposite, your adjacent, hypotenuse. If we look at the triangle that contains theta two, we don't really explicitly have those angles. Yes, or side lengths. We do have A2, which would be the hypotenuse there, um, but we don't have the opposite and the adjacent. If we look at the triangles we do have, we can see we have a triangle here with the R length, the A1 length length, and the A2 length length. And so looking at that triangle, including the theta two triangle, we're given this. So if we add some notation, this is our theta two. This length is considered our A1. It's considered our A2. This is R. And then this is some angle that we will denote as phi. Now, if we see phi and theta two can add up to 180 degrees. And this will play very useful in helping us solve explicitly for theta 2. So now looking at the triangle we have with a1, a2, and r, we can use log cosines. And with log cosines, in this case, it translates to r squared is equal to a1 squared plus a2 squared minus 2a1a2 cosine of that opposite angle, which there is phi. And if we rearrange this, we can get this explicitly for cosine of phi. And here we have cosine of phi explicitly, but we don't want cosine of phi, we want cosine of theta two, so we can get theta two. If we look at this relationship we had earlier, we can see that this can be solved such that phi is equal to 180 minus theta two. Now there is a, an identity such that cosine 180 of an angle, in this case theta two, is equal to negative cosine of that same angle here, theta two. So we plug that back in to our formula here. We can rewrite this so that it is negative cosine of theta two is equal to our product here. And then lastly, our product is cosine of theta two is equal to r squared uh, minus a one squared minus a two squared all over two a one a two. As said in the beginning, um, we can solve for r. So using the triangle that is created from this beginning with o x O, Y, and R, we have a right triangle. I um, mean, we can get like the, like so, R, O, X, and O, Y, and we can solve for R explicitly such that R squared is equal to O, X squared plus O, Y squared, and this is using the Pythagorean theorem. If we would like to have or uh, specifically, we just take the square root of all that, and we get ox squared plus oy squared. Now, back to our cosine of theta 2. Um, we are not finished. We'd like to get this in two terms um, of a tangent. Um, is seen to be more robust, and it eliminates the dependence on the arm lengths. So we will take that, and we will begin working towards getting a tangent term. And to get a tangent term, um, like any tangent, you need a sine term and a cosine term, which in this instance, we just have the cosine term. So we'll use an identity, the Pythagorean identity for trig, such that sine squared of an angle plus cosine squared of an angle equals one. 
and then we can get that sine of an angle is equal to the square root of 1 minus cosine squared of an angle. And then we can get our a tan for theta 2. And we can simplify this. Um, we will denote this entire cosine term as one term b. And we can get our final term of theta 2 equals a tan 2 of the square root of 1 minus b squared all over b. We will now begin solving for theta 1. So we would use similar methods to how we found theta 2 um, and using triangles and side lengths that we are known um, and that we can use. So looking at our figure here, we know r, um, we do know the distance in the x and the distance in the y, lx and oy respectively, um, and we can use those to create a triangle um, and get some angles. So if we look at a triangle, uh, theta 1, we can't really find explicitly because we don't know between like this length, between where A1 ends and how it extends out to create that triangle of theta 2. So what we can do is assign new angles like we did in the last problem. So we'll assign an angle for that whole triangle, which we will denote as psi. And we will also denote that since psi minus theta 1, or since there is an angle between theta 1 and psi, we can calculate that and denote that as a new angle, which we would call beta. So now we have that theta 1 plus beta is equal to psi. And we will use this uh, to eventually calculate theta 1, because we can say theta 1 is equal to psi minus beta, and we can calculate psi and beta specifically. So to be, do that, we'll start with psi. So uh, psi is actually fairly easy to calculate, since it, this is a right triangle. Um, we can calculate just simple tangent of with uh, ox and oy. So then our psi is just equal to the a tan 2 of oy over ox. Similar to calculating psi, we can calculate beta, um, and doing so we can do with a 90 degree or right triangle. Um, so the line that we extend out for, for showing theta 2, so right here, uh, allows the creation of that right triangle, which I've re uh, redrawn over here. And so one thing we can note now that we have theta 2, we can write these additional lengths um, in with respect to theta 2. So now this additional length is a2 cosine theta 2 and this additional length is a2 sine 2. So now, now we can just find uh, beta, which is here, um, as explicitly as a tan 2 of the y. So it's going to be this one, a2 sine of theta 2 all over a1 plus a2 cosine of theta 2. And one thing to note too is that these are need added. So now we have these two and now we can calculate for our theta 1 or theta 2 or theta 1 sorry. So now theta 1 since it's equal to psi minus beta um, theta 1 is equal to a tan 2 of oy over ox minus a tan 2 of what beta was. So that is the a2 sine theta 2 over the a1 plus a2 cosine theta 2. And now we can begin working towards our third variable, which is d3. So I've drawn this uh, additional diagram. This is kind of just a side view of what's going on here. And I provide this new figure to give that, that uh, different perspective. So one thing to note here, so we know D1 is the distance between frame zero to frame one. Um, and then we'll have, we designate the distance between frame two um, and frame three is D2. 
D3 is the variable one we're looking for. Um, and then OZ is just the distance between the uh, revolute joint. So that's um, in figure three, it's over here to the center of the end effector. So in calculating this, we will solve for the center of the end effector, which is going to be OZ. So that's equal to D1, since that's the length within uh, frame zero and frame one, minus D2. And then minus that variable D3. Um, and this is all going off of the convention we are laying here, that positive is up for Z. And so if we explicitly solve for D3, we will get D3 is equal to D1 minus D2 minus OZ. So now we'll start finding theta 4. Um, so with theta 4, uh, we're going to use the transformation matrix that the book provided um, here. This is equation 5.46. Um, and so one thing to note, so I prefaced this demonstration with uh, the just different identities for trig. So here we will be using the sum and difference identities. Um, and it's going to give us a, a lot simpler of an answer. So just looking at this, you know, top three by three a rotation matrix of our transformation matrix, you, we can see that we have a, multiple products of cosine and sine, respectively. So let's take this first element. So right here, uh, first row, first column. So we have cosine of theta one plus theta two, or like that, uh, times cosine of four plus sine of theta one plus theta two um, times sine of theta four. And one thing uh, to note here, so this is very similar to our cosine identity here. So then we can use that to simplify. But one thing to make it easier, theta 1 and theta 2 will make A and uh, theta 4 will make B. So then this can be rewritten as cosine A cosine B plus sine A sine B. And uh, now that resembles the uh, formula for this identity, as we said. So this can be written as cosine of A minus B, which and then is, in this instance would be cosine of theta 1 plus theta 2 minus theta 4. And we use this uh, simplification for the rest of the rotation matrix, so mainly this 2 by 2 in the top left, to simplify. Um, and we'll get our simplified rotation matrix here. And like we had said, so using that simplification, we get theta 1 plus theta 2 minus theta 4, which we can rename as one whole angle alpha, which is what the book denotes here. And now we've uh, determined all of our angles, all of our uh, distances. So we have all of our joint variables, and here we have our final equations.